नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन Which of the following statements are correct regarding CMV infection? So they are asking about the correct statement about the cytomegalovirus infection. Okay. So number first, CMV is the most common type of non-syndromic sensory neural hearing loss in children. First statement. This statement is true, students. Number second. In developing countries, primary cytomegalovirus infection is more common than reactivation. Students, this statement is wrong. In developing countries, the reactivation is more commonly seen as compared to the primary cytomegalovirus infection. So, this statement is wrong. 30 to 40 percent infections are asymptomatic. Again, wrong. 90 percent of the symptoms are, uh, patients are asymptomatic. Okay, and then. Presence of the virus in urine after four weeks is diagnostic wrong. So you have to look for the virus in urine, but within two to three weeks of the birth of the baby. Okay. So the right option is A, and so answer is A. Now a few lines about the cytomegalovirus infection. Students, CMV infection. It is the most common congenital infection in neonates. So in the torch group of infections that we always talk about, it is the most common congenital infection in neonate. And the risk of infection is greatest with maternal primary CNV infection than recurrence infection. So, if the mother is suffering from the primary infection, the risk is more. Okay. And the perinatal transmission is very common. At the time of delivery, 40%, breast milk, 6 to 12%. 90% of the babies are asymptomatic. Symptoms that are there is prematurity, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, petechiae. Hepatospinomegaly, microcephaly, and chorioretinitis. And hearing loss is the most common long term sequelae that is seen in congenital CMV infection. Okay. Now, for the diagnosis, within three weeks of life, viral isolation is to be done, and the best sample is the urine. And for the treatment, you have gencyclovir. Okay. So, this is some important points about the cytomegalovirus infections. All these viral infections, the Todd group of infections, these are very, very important topic from MCQ point of view. Every time the question has been asked on one or two viral infections or the infections topic. Okay. Next, cystic fibrosis, a very, very common topic to be asked in INICT. Okay. So, in cystic fibrosis, the mutation affects which ion transport? So, firstly, the which ion transport, which amino acid, and which position? So, this is something that is a very, very direct question. You have to just cram it, remember it. So, all you all know that it is the options A is 508, phenylalanine is the amino acid and the ion is chloride. So, option answer is A. The other options that were given was 708, 708, 7. No, this is not the position. Tryptophan is not the amino acid and calcium is not the iron that is affected. Okay, so very direct question, nothing is there. So, 508 position, phenylalanine and chloride is the iron that is affected in the CFTR, uh, cystic fibrosis. So, cystic fibrosis you all know is an autosomal recessive condition and this CFTR gene is present on chromosome number 7, very important. This can also be asked in the MCQ. Okay, so this has already been previously been asked. CFTR gene, most common mutation is at the location 508. Phenyl alanine absence is there in the CFTR protein, which leads to a defective CFTR that is cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator protein. And because of this protein, this CFTR protein is a component of the ATP gated chloride channels in the cell membrane. Okay, so chloride channels, ATP gated chloride channels are affected. So Chloride is the ion that is affected and because of this effect, what happens is the misfolded protein, there is absence of the ATP gated chloride channels in the epithelial surface of the body and which leads to various manifestations of cystic fibrosis. Okay. Now, next question. Chances of febrile seizure in children increases in which of the following conditions? It's a direct table from the Nelson students. Okay. So, so, febrile seizure risk increases in which of the conditions? Age of less than 1 years, fever of less than 24 hours, fever of more than 24 hours, 
and a temperature between 38 to 39 degrees Celsius. Okay. So, let us talk about this table now. Risk factor of recurrence of febrile seizures. This table is given in Nelson. Very important table students. Just remember it. The major factors are age less than 1 year. That is when the febrile seizure appears in child below 1 year of age. You know the febrile seizure definition is from 6 months to 5 years. Okay. So, if a febrile seizure in less than 1 year of age, there is high chances of recurrence. When a febrile seizure duration of fever less than 24 hours. So, when it appears within 24 hours of onset of the fever, it is a major criteria. Chances of recurrence of febrile seizure increases in these cases. And a temperature, a fever of 38 to 39 degrees Celsius in such low temperatures, if the child is having febrile seizure, again, this is a risk factor of recurrence of febrile seizure. So, the minor factors are the family history of febrile seizure, family history of epilepsy, complex febrile seizure, daycare, male sex and serum sodium low at the time of presentation. So, these are the minor risk factors. Now, when we talk about our question, the chances of the febrile seizure increases in which children? Age of less than 1 year? Yes. When the febrile seizure appears below 1 year of age. Fever within of less than 24 hours duration? Yes. So, 1 and 2 are right. Fever of more than 24 hours? Wrong. And temperature of between 38 to 39 degrees Celsius and the child having febrile seizure, this is again a major risk factor for febrile seizure. So, answer is 1, 2 and 4. So, the option number again C, 1, 2 and 4. This is the answer. A very, very direct question. Nothing like no clinical history based question, a direct question and the answer is C. Okay. Now, UTI, urinary tract infection. Again, two questions have been asked in this NICT exam about the UTI. So, let us talk about this question firstly. Regarding UTI, urinary tract infection in children, the correct options among the following are. Correct option. So, you have to talk about the correct option. Number first, most common cause is streptococcal pneumonia. So, students, you all know the most common cause of UTI in children is E. coli. More than 95% cases, E. coli. Other options, other are Klebsiella and Proteus. So, not Streptococcus pneumoniae. Okay. Then, so this option is wrong. Next question. Bowel and bladder dysfunction increases the risk. This option is true, students. So, this is one of the important risk factor for the UTI. So, in the child with the constipation, again, UTI chances increases. Okay, bowel bladder dysfunction increases the risk. Female sex, catheterization. So, these all are the important. Voiding dysfunction, these all are important risk factors for the UTI. So, this answer is right. Recurrent UTI should get MCU. Again, this is a true statement. So, recurrent is when the UTI episode occurs second time, more than one time episode. Recurrent UTI. And MCU is maturating cystourethrogram. Yes, we have to get a maturating cystourethrogram in all the children with recurrent UTI. Okay, because in recurrent UTI, we have to rule out the vasicourethral reflux. That is a very, very common cause of UTI in children. So, this has to be done. Option 4 is all of the above? No. So, answer is 2 and 3. So, option is B is correct. Now, Students, the next question again on UTI. What should be the order of investigations in less than 3 years of old with UTI? A less than 3 years old baby with UTI. So, students, I want to discuss a table with you about it. So, if a child is having a first episode of UTI, okay, the child having first episode of UTI, how should you investigate the child? So, UTI you have already labeled by the urine culture and urine routine microscopy you have done. You have labeled the patient as UTI. Now, the, when we talk about the radiological investigations, less than 1 years of age, all the child with first episode of UTI, you have to do a ultrasound. You have to do a MCU that is maturating cystourethrogram and you have to see a, do a, you have to do a DMCA scan. Okay. Now, in the children with 1 to 5 years of age with first episode of UTI, only ultrasound you need to done and a DMSA scan. Okay, ultrasound and DMSA scan you will do. 
if there is any problem in any of the two, then you have to do a MCU. And in more than five years of age, you need to do only the ultrasound. If the ultrasound is abnormal, then you have to go for DMSC and the MCU scan. So this is the table that you, you have to always remember. And now this will uh, answer you a question. So order of the investigation they have asked in child of less than three years of age with UTI. So ultrasound, yes, definitely. First, you will do the ultrasound. Second, you will do a DMSC scan. And if any of the two will be abnormal, then you will go for a MCU. Okay. So the options will be 1, 3, 2. 1, 3 and 2. So option C is right. So students, UTI is a very important topic and INICT exam then generally asks for UTI. So just keep in points the important points regarding the urinary tract infections. Next, incorrect about parvovirus B19 infection. They have asked for the incorrect statement. Okay, so slabbed cheek appearance. Very, very important. So in the slab cheek appearance, this is the slab cheek appearance that you see, which is caused by parvovirus B19, which virus? This is arrhythmia. Uh, parvovirus B19 infection causing arrhythmia infectiosum, also known as fifth disease. So, it's arrhythmia infectiosum or fifth disease. The characteristic feature is this slab cheek appearance caused by parvovirus B19. Okay. Next is aplastic crisis. So, you all must have read in your hemolytic anemia topics that parvovirus B19 leads to a, uh, aplastic crisis. So, this is what we all know. Non-immune hydrops fetalis. Yes, this is a very important cause. In the fetal, when the fetus go, get infected by parvovirus B19, there is RBC aplasia and there is non-immune hydrops fetalis is there. Okay. Number fourth option is erosive arthritis. So, this is not the right option. This is something that is not done by the parvovirus B19 infection. So, the incorrect about uh, parvovirus B19 is option D that is erosive arthritis. Okay. Now, coming to the next question. All of the following vaccines are recommended to be given uh, before splenectomy except. Okay. So, Options are typhoid vaccine, H influenza vaccine, meningococcal vaccine, and pneumococcal vaccine. Okay, so all of the following vaccines are recommended before splenectomy. So, what all infections are very common after splenectomy? The infections by the encapsulated organisms because now there is no spleen to filter RBC. So, encapsulated organism infections are very, very common after splenectomy. Now, encapsulated organisms are Haemophilus influenzae, Neisseria meningitidis, and Streptococcal pneumonia. So, these three vaccines are very, very important to be given before splenectomy. Typhoid vaccine is not necessary to be given before splenectomy. Okay. Now, a few important points of, about splenectomy are the major long term risk factor of splenectomy is. Sudden overwhelming post splenectomy infections, sepsis or meningitis. And this risk is specifically more in children less than 5 years of age. So, we should always uh, consider doing splenectomy after 5 years of age if it's possible. Okay. And the encapsulated bacteria is responsible for most number of cases streptococcal pneumonia, H influenza, and Neisseria meningitis. That's why 14 days. Before splenectomy, we have to immunize these child with the pneumococcal, meningococcal and H influenza vaccine. Also important point of remember is pneumococcal vaccine. Which pneumococcal vaccine to be given? Okay. So, PCV13, you always give. Okay. The most important is all the post splenectomy patients should receive PCV23. So, you know PCV23 is a polysaccharide vaccine that can be given only after the age of 2 years. Okay. So, the first dose of PCV23, the after 2 years of age and next dose to be given after 5 years. Okay. 
so two doses of pcv 13 should always be given to all the children of post lenectomy children also yearly influenza vaccine should also be given because influenza infection is a risk factor for secondary pneumococcal infections okay so these are the important points so one is the immunization and number second is the prophylaxis with the oral penicillin that need to be given in these children okay coming to the next question students a child presented with a decreased pulse in her lower limbs and delay compared to pulse felt in the upper limb what can be the underlying condition again a very very direct question so decreased pulse in the lower limb and there is delay in the pulse as compared to the upper limb so options are transposition of great arteries ventricular septal defect tetralogy of fallot and coarctation of aorta i think there is no doubt in this question the answer is coarctation of aorta okay so what are the features the tga you see cyanosis tof you see cyanosis and there is no mentioning of the cyanosis in the question now vsd ventricular septal defect is a left to right shunt which presents with the congestive cardiac failure okay now in the coarctation of aorta what happens is so as the name suggests coarctation of aorta this is the juxta ductal coarctation which is the most common location of the coarctation of aorta and because of this coarctation a less amount of the blood is going to the lower part of the body and because of this all these manifestations happen okay so in the coarctations the manifestations is because of the pressure overload in arterial circulation proximal to coarctation so what happens is as there is coarctation so the left ventricle has to put on more pressure in order to pump the blood in the aorta and to overcome this coarctation okay so the features hypertension in the upper part of the body which can because of the hypertension there can be intracranial hemorrhage hypertensive encephalopathy or the heart failure and because a less amount of the blood is going into the lower part of the body descending aorta so there are symptoms of intermittent claudication pain in the lower limb weakness dyspnea on running and cold feet and what you see signs is there is disparity in the pulsations that is there is given in the topic so pulsations in the lower limb is less as compared to the upper limb and also the blood pressure in the lower limb will be low as compared to the upper limb okay there will be radio femoral delay as mentioned in the question and differential cyanosis very very important seen in coarctation of aorta also because of the renal blood flow decrease there will be hypertension so these are the important points in the coarctation of aorta so students this is a very very direct question no second option can be there only coarctation of aorta okay next question a child presents with hemolytic faces and splenomegaly what all investigations will you do so hemolytic faces and splenomegaly it indicates that the child is suffering from a chronic hemolytic condition okay chronic hemolytic anemia now if a patient of chronic hemolytic anemia comes to you what do you want to see peripheral smear you will always do a cbc with a peripheral smear in order to see peripheral hemolytic cells okay which type of cells that can be seen in order to see the hemolytic to rule out the hemolytic condition the child is suffering from okay then uh, hplc need to be done okay bone marrow aspiration is something that don't need to be done why because bone marrow aspiration is when you think about the leukemia the any conditions of the cancer so leukemia or aplastic anemia in these conditions you need a bone marrow and coagulation studies pt aptt again there is no need of this splenomegaly is there there is hemolytic phases so there is no correlation so answer is 1 and 2 that need to be done in this patient so 1 and 2 option is a okay now again a question from the hema pediatric hematology all are true regarding the hemophilia a except so you have to talk about the incorrect statement factor 8 deficiency yes hemophilia a is due to factor 8 deficiency this is right next it's a x linked recessive inheritance very very important remember hemophilia a hemophilia b both are x linked recessive inheritance and because these have a x linked recessive inheritance so they are more commonly seen in males again true 
नेक्स्ट इज म्यूकोजल ब्लीडिंग इज कॉमन सो दिस इज अ फॉल्स स्टेटमेंट स्टूडेंट्स यू नो हाउ टू डिफ्रेंशिएट द प्लेटलेट और द वैस्कुलर डिफेक्ट ब्लीडिंग डिफेक्ट फ्रॉम द कोगुलेशन फैक्टर डिसऑर्डर्स बिकॉज इन द कोगुलेशन फैक्टर डिसऑर्डर्स पेटी के परप्यूरा दिज म्यूकोजल ब्लीडिंग इज नॉट कॉमनली सीन ओके बट इन प्लेटलेट एंड वैस्कुलर डिफेक्ट दीज आर मोर कॉमनली सीन सो आंसर इज डी इन हीमोफीलिया वट यू कॉमनली सी इज हीम आर्थ्रोसिस हीम आर्थ्रोसिस इन वेट बियरिंग ज्वाइंट दिस इज द मोस्ट कॉमन क्लिनिकल मैनिफेस्टेशन डेट यू सी एंड अगेन द नेक्स्ट एम सी क्यू विच इज द अर्लीएस्ट ज्वाइंट टू बी इन्वॉल्व इन हीमोफीलिया ए द अर्लीएस्ट ज्वाइंट इज द एंकल ज्वाइंट सो एज आई टॉक अबाउट द वेट बियरिंग ज्वाइंट सो एंकल ज्वाइंट इज द अर्लीएस्ट ज्वाइंट फॉर हीम आर्थ्रोसिस ओके सो आंसर इज डी इन दिस क्वेश्चन नाउ नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन An 18 months old baby came to the emergency with a history of choking and cyanosis. Clinical examination shows limited air entry on the left side of the lung. The correct management would include so the history a toddler 18 months old coming in the emergency with choking and cyanosis. The history classical of a foreign body aspiration. so history classical of foreign body aspiration is there okay with on examination finding a left side because left side obstruction must have happened so there is limited air entry on the left side of the lung so now correct management how to manage this case a chest x ray need to be done bronchoscopy icit drainage or cct chest so foreign body around 80 60 to 80% of these foreign bodies are radio opaque radio lucent but then also you, on the chest x ray you have to see the hyper inflation of the chest okay so this is the first investigation you can see the foreign body or you can see the hyper inflation of one side of the chest so this is what you see on the chest x ray now bronchoscopy it's the management of choice in the cases of foreign body you have to immediately remove that foreign body with a bronchoscopy icit drainage is not required in foreign body icit intracostal drainage so that is to be done in the cases of pleural effusion empyema pyonemothorax okay so this is not to be done in the cases of foreign body and cct chest is also not required in all the cases of foreign body okay so one and two is something that is definitely required for the management of foreign body okay so option is a now a few points about the foreign body aspiration the most common objects are the food items the most common most serious complication of foreign body aspiration is complete obstruction of the airway so if there is sudden complete obstruction of the airway the child will have a respiratory arrest the most common age group is older infants and the toddlers because they have a tendency to put everything in the mouth to explore the environment okay now whenever there is foreign body aspiration the initial event is there is paroxysms of cough gagging and choking and then there comes a asymptomatic period that's why mostly foreign bodies leaves and uh, we are not able to detect them in the correct time because initially there is paroxysms of coughing choking and gagging and there there is a asymptomatic interval is there the foreign body gets becomes lost reflexes fatigue and immediate irritating symptoms subside and afterwards the complication happens there is obstruction erosion and infection when the child goes to the doctor okay so in the history you will get a choking coughing episode there can be new onset wheezing with asymmetrical breath sound as was mentioned in our question okay so the left side air entry was decreased and as i told you that 80% of the foreign bodies are radio lucent by then too we have to do the chest x ray to see the remaining 15 to 20% of foreign body and also you can see ear trapping asymmetrical hyperinflation of chest obstructive emphysema atelectasis mediastinal shift and consolidation okay so look at this x ray so this x ray is the inspiratory view of the chest and this is the expiratory view of the chest in the expiration too as you can see the left side is hyperinflated so because of the foreign body aspiration they is not able to go out at the time of expiration so there is hyperinflation of the chest of the left side it's characteristically seen in the foreign body and in the right you see all of the air as it goes out 
so there is whitening is there on the right side but left side as it is obstructed the left side the air is not able to go out and it's hypoinflated at the left side and management is endoscopic removal with the rigid instrument bronchoscopy is to be done okay so students this is all about the discussion about the inict 2022 november questions in the pediatrics i hope now you will be able to recall these questions and now you will not commit the mistakes that you have done in this exam in the future exams thank you